This is a Dreamcast disc and is for use only on a Dreamcast unit. Playing this disc on a hi-fi or other audio equipment can cause serious damage to its speakers. Dreamcast, up to six billion players. Welcome back to the stage of history. Why don't we play together? Hey, 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 it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go! Please stop this disc now. Now, 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 now. Hello and welcome to episode 55 of the Dreamcast Junkyard Dream Pod. And Merry Christmas to all our listeners. Uh, my name is Tom and I'm joined by my faithful co-host, Mr. Mike Phelan. Hi, Mike. Hi, Tom. Are you feeling very festive? No. Okay, I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're also joined by uh, a man who has been uh, he has been absent from the podcast for a while, but his name is uh, Rob Jones. Hi, Rob. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Actually, I feel a bit rough because I went on and out last night, so I'm just kind of recovering from that. That's kind of the problem, isn't it, with this time of year? It's incredibly busy because everyone's sort of like, oh, God, we've got to get everything done before Christmas. But equally, there's a dump truck load of nights out because there's yeah. Christmas parties and whatnot, and, you know, it's quite difficult to uh, balance the two. It's very true, mate, very true. Guys, we have a very, very special guest. His name is John Linneman. He is the uh, the voice and the face behind Digital Foundry's DF Retro and, of course, Digital Foundry itself, and also Eurogamer. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's good to be here. No, it's uh, it's fantastic that you've agreed to come on the show. I'm a big fan of your content. Um, well, thank and you. Your voice has been reverberating around my school for the last week because <laughs> I've been catching up on all of your videos, <laughs> not just the uh, <laughs> retro ones, but also the uh, the current gen stuff. Um How's, uh, how's your Christmas uh, experience going thus far? Oh, it's been it's been great. Busy, getting ready to fly back to the states for a little bit and oh, yeah. visit some family and let's, you know get some time off after cranking out tons of videos for a while now. Yeah, some where is videos. You, where is your hometown back in the states? I'm based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cool. Is that somewhere you've been, Rob? No, not at all. But I've heard that Cincinnati is meant to be very nice. Oh. It's not a bad place, and it fortunately has some very very good arcades. <laughs> yeah, there's some there's some very well known retro YouTubers that live there as well that I will visit. So wow. uh, it's an interesting place. You learn something every day. I didn't really, uh, I didn't, I never really associated Cincinnati with with retro gaming, but you know now I do. So thanks for that. It's, it's weirdly <laughs> becoming that way. So yeah, <laughs> guys, we're going to start as we always do on this uh, festive edition of the Dream Pod. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some games that we've played and some games we may have picked up on the Dreamcast or on current-gen systems. Uh, John, you are our guest, so I'm going to come to you first and ask you what have you been playing or what have you picked up recently? Oh, geez, what have I picked up recently? Um, I've been so busy cranking through holiday games and such. I've been kind of, I guess, over the past week since I've been traveling, I've been replaying ukulele and the Switch. Ah, oh, yes, <laughs> yes. I saw your video on that. It's very good. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really good portable game. Just nice to pick up and play, you know. Mm. Uh, it's a nice looking little platformer yeah. outside of that um trying to finish up sort of going back to some of the games i'm working on my game of the year video right now because i'm going to do that this year cool and so just kind of replaying and recapturing bits of my favorite games and preparing for that i know in your videos you, you have um when you when you actually show it on camera you have this kind of wall of games in the background yeah yeah um, so are you a big kind of retro collector or yeah, and that's just one wall, so there's right. more to it than that. And yeah, so I do collect quite a few games. Um, I'll have to go through, maybe do a room tour sometime to sort of cover everything. But <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a decent amount of stuff there. I guess one of the things I picked up that's kind of like the reverse of collecting, but it was more like a good way to get it up and working again, was I got a uh, USB reader for the 3DO. Oh, wow. So I've cool. had a really hard, I have an F1. I did got the 240p mod going on it. Um Looks great, but mm. the CD-ROM drive has been a pain in the butt to keep working, and I finally just decided to shell out for one of those, and it's been really cool just being able to load up anything in the 3DO, and it loads faster, and I'm kind of exploring some of these old systems again just because I'd like to do some more videos on them next year. Yeah, the um, the mod for the 3DO, so how does that connect to the 3DO? Is it, is it through the serial port on the back? So the, on, the side? On, the, on the FZ1, it's the tray loader mm. system. And the great part about that is you just pop off the top, unplug the power and data cable, and you just plug this thing in, and it's oh, good to go. Right, so it's, it's very, one, very simple. Thing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's the one. That's the model I had. Um, I got rid of it recently because um, I had a big clear out. 
But um, yeah, that's the one I had. That's probably my favorite one, actually, out of all of the uh, different designs of the. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, it's it's nice looking. Yeah. And the 240p mod is essential, I think. Yeah, that I, really improves the image quality. I didn't go that far, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it was a, it's a nice looking system. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Rob, what about you? You've not been on the podcast for a while. Have you picked anything up or played anything interesting? I'm afraid it's been quite uh, sparse as of late. It's just been absolutely mental busy. You know, there's been like Black Friday and that sort of, they call, you know, that entire period is such a crazy busy time um, for us over at Future and specifically on T3. And so it's just been sort of non-stop, um, non-stop work really. But um, I have managed to squeeze in a little bit of time on South Park Fractured But Whole. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the original. Stick of Truth I thought was absolutely fabulous and um this one isn't as funny as consistently but they've sort of expanded the combat system um and the class system in 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 kind of nice ways so i'd say that the combat's nice and fresh but the writing and the sort of the general gag rate isn't as isn't as good it's um go on sorry john it's a completely different developer i believe isn't that right i don't know i'm i'm sorry i don't know enough about you probably know more than me yeah yeah i think um the original was done by Obsidian, you know. Oh, well, of, uh, they've got they've got serious pedigree, haven't they? Yeah, and the the second one, uh, I can't remember who worked on it, but it was a different company for Ubisoft, I think, that did it. So it's a completely separate developer this time, I believe. Uh, yeah, which I, which is interesting. So does it actually feel like the original at all? Does it feel like a continuation of it, or does it actually feel like a very different game? Oh, no, definitely. I mean, I think they've done quite well. Literally, the game starts sort of as the the last game ends. So it's like they're still playing uh, the sort of (laughs) RPG sort of game they've been playing around the stick of truth. So it's all sort of like Lord of the Rings style. Um, And then essentially the kids, I won't go into details in case anyone wants to play it, but uh, (laughs) cause and effect something happens that means that they switch the, the games they're playing and it sort of goes into oh. su- superhero parody mode instead. Um, so yeah, no, I, it definitely feels the same. It's ju- I've just not laughed as much. I mean, okay. some of those bits from the first game, like specifically when you get abducted by the aliens with Randy on the spaceship. I mean, <laughs> I was just laughing nonstop <laughs> during that bit, but um, yeah, I'm, ha- I'm totally having fun with it. And it's nice because it's that old fashioned turn based combat and it's just nice to dip in and out of, um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. The, the last South Park game I played was a uh, South Park Chef's Love Shack, and I didn't laugh at all. That. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I cried most of the time. <laughs> that is no fun. <laughs> and I, what was the god awful? There was a South Park multiplayer um, FPS on the, oh, N64. the N64 one. Yeah. Park. Oh, yeah. it's horrible. Yeah, that was oh, terrible. The fog of war. It was like, ah. Yeah, it didn't <laughs> it like use the Turok engine. It used the Turok engine, didn't it? It was, yes. You're yeah, right. You're right. right. It had just, you couldn't see more than like a meter in front of your face. <laughs> um, the only other pickup I got was a, <laughs> the, the only other thing I've picked up in that time is a game called Pool Bar Story for Sega Saturn. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, there's sort of ten a penny now on, on Android smartphones or, or phones. You know those sort of top-down pool games yeah. where you sort of pull your cue back and you can fire the ball around the table? Mm. Well, it's like that, but on Sega Saturn. But of course, because it's a, a Japanese exclusive, it's sort of pool game slash dating sim. So, <laughs> Voice Idol Maniacs, that one? Voice Idol Maniacs, yes, you're right. Yes, I have this. This is such a bizarre game. It's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? It's mental. Um but, you know, I mean, I've written, as Tom will know, and people who followed the yard for a bit, like these, some of these crazy Japanese dating games I've written about in the past. But this one, I, this one, that's exactly why it drew it to me. Because I was like, well, I like these top-down pool games, and I find these crazy Japanese dating sims just ridiculous. And this is a combination of them both. So, <laughs> But actually, it's quite good. I mean, away from the sort of, the, the, the sort of very loose dating stuff, the, the, there's various different game modes. You know, you can play different types of pool. There's trick shots, eight ball, nine ball. So, you know... <laughs> Cool. Let's keep you entertained. But that's it, I'm afraid. No, it sounds like a good, uh, good mix. Um, Rob, uh, sorry, not Rob. Mike. Mike. Yes. Yeah. Hello. It's me. Hello, Mike. Hello. Hello. The most cheerful, <laughs> the most cheerful man on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> I got a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've been playing. I've got a, a massive backlog of games, but I've been playing um, NHL 18. All right, which is oh, cool. weird, really, because I haven't played an HL game for, for well, since the last HL game was probably reviewing uh, 2K2 on the 
Dreamcast. <laughs> what do you um, think of that? What do you think about that? I played the demo um, when that was released. And I had some fun. Eighteen. Yeah, I love it. I, I've uh, I've done the first season on um, on Be a Pro mode, um, and won the Stanley Cup, which was a, a good start. Um, <laughs> yeah, it seemed it just seems suddenly of I am playing sports games for quite a while on one gen consoles because I don't really like the sort of I have an issue with difficulty levels with sports games. It's either too easy. To yeah. the point of to the point of just boringness or or too frustratingly hard, and I just found the the right niche with uh, with um, with NHL, and just, I'm loving it. Yeah, I've, I'm second season. Now. I think I played 194 games in total. It's got yeah. great. Um, um, it's got great um, kind of presentation as well. The last one I played was 16, and that, yeah, that was that was amazing. I've not bought another one since then because I still play 16 every now and then. So I don't know. You know it's but, not um, it's not got the whole. Um, I know that the Madden and, and all those series have done a lot more. In terms of um, the story mode, you oh, yeah. a lot more around the beer pro mode, and you saw a lot more uh, detail. Hasn't got that on it, so it's a bit more bare bones. Yeah. Um, but I think it just allows the game to, to shine. Really, I, I love it. It's a fantastic game. I'm sure that people who've played hockey games for the last 15 years nonstop, yeah, will probably not agree with me. But I think that's very much my opinion on that. I mean, John might know more. I mean, I'm I'm not you know like I'm not a massive hockey hockey like uh, game fanatic or anything, but. I mean, I literally just picked it up because the demo was available and I thought it looked pretty impressive. And playing the threes on that, it was just sort of very fast-paced, yeah. loads of goals. It seemed pretty smooth, but then the reviews came out and what I saw, it was just like, meh. So I don't know. Well, and the thing as well is obviously for, for us in the UK, it's quite a big thing because obviously it's got UK teams in it as well. Was it? It's got the European Champions League hockey okay. uh, featured in it. And obviously we've got Cardiff Devils and uh, Nottingham Panthers both in it this year. Cool. So they're both on it, which is quite a big thing for hockey fans in the UK. Is Manchester um, Storm in it? <laughs> it's, they're not. They didn't make champions, unfortunately. <laughs> no, they don't exist. Anymore, are they, are they still going? Even no, though? I, no, I don't no, no idea. So, no, no, no. no idea. <laughs> um, that's just quite cool. Um, I've also been playing uh, Steep, the new. Um, I got Steep when it came out. And I didn't like it, but I've been down, oh, yeah. I've been playing the the Winter Olympics um, DLC oh, yeah. for it, which is is pretty good actually. I, I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm a massive Winter Olympics fan, so um, it's it's probably the only. It's probably the best Winter Olympics game I've played since a very brief go on Alpine Games for Lynx oh. a couple of years ago. Um, which was, if anyone's was, played that game, is fantastic. Wasn't that the new one that came out sort of post mortem Alpine Games? Yeah, yeah. So it came out. It's um, by um, Duranic. by Duranic. Yeah, Duranic, yeah, yeah. Indeed, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's um, really, really impressive uh, game, and uh, so it's a really steep. It's a good DLC. It's got all the events on there, but it's got a really weird structure to it. Um, and apart from that, on the Dreamcast, I have been still trying to get all my reviews done and, and my quest of getting every Dreamcast game reviewed. I'm up to 517. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so I've got about 100, 150 odd to go. John, um, if, John, if you don't know, uh, Mike is uh, he's on this quest to review every Dreamcast game and he's compiling a sort of an ebook of every game. Amazing. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot of work. And, uh, my... 316 pages so far. And I'm, wow. uh, Incredible. I'm starting to hate Japanese visual novels for the next time. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, seriously, I, what, like, I played some game the other day and I just, I, 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 I think I actually did fall asleep. Um, <laughs> not because it was a boring game, because it was some weird, weird stuff going on. But I just, I, no, I couldn't get my head around it at all. Um, but that's, it's good fun to you've got to have a hobby, haven't you? Yeah, it's a tough job, mate. But someone's got to do it, and yeah, unfortunately, yeah, exactly. that person <laughs> is you. Apparently, is me. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, good selection of games there, fellas. Uh, I'll just quickly run through some of the things I've been playing in the in the three yeah. or so weeks that we've not had a podcast out. I have actually played quite a few games because I kind of dip in and out of stuff. And obviously, as Rob mentioned earlier, there was a Black Friday uh, sale, so I picked up a couple of games then as well. So on the PS4, I've been playing on Dirt Four. Uh, the rally yeah. game, which I I actually think is oh, probably, yes. possibly the best rally game on the PS4 at the moment. Amazing Whoa, game. Yeah. Whoa, big yeah. words. Yeah. Amazing yeah. Game. Uh, I know you did a uh, an analysis of it, uh, John, on Digital Foundry. I don't know if it was you who actually did it. Um, yeah, it wasn't me specifically, but yeah, we did one. Yeah, um, and that was obviously, that was comparing, was it the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro? Or, or That would make sense, yeah, especially yeah. these days. Mm. So that was that was good, and um, yeah, so I'll pick that up, and I think it's a brilliant game. I've also been playing Wolfenstein 2. Oh, uh, man, now you need to tell yeah. me about this. Like, I played the demo, and I was like, give it give it to me more, and I was gutted because I only sort of got round to it after the um, the Black Friday sales, and I was yeah. like, I knew I knew you'd picked it up, Tom, and then I went to the store, and I was like, what? It's how much? Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, how's it? How is it? How are you finding it's, it? Everything you've heard about it is is right. Basically, it's just a yeah. really, really, really good game. It's a great, the, fun shooter. Did you play the first one? I did, and I've also played the um, the sort of the expansion. The old blood. Yeah, the old blood. Yes. Um, awesome. And, what? Yeah. Go on. Go sorry. on sorry. Uh, no, I yeah. keep interrupting you. Sorry. Go on. Shut up, Rob. Stop. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, as I was going to say, it's, everything you've heard about is it, true. It's a fantastic shooter. It's got a great story. There's loads of really good, cool twists. There's one twist that is a bit too far. I think yep. in the storyline, yep. um, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, <laughs> but I was going to be like, "What?" Uh, when that happened, but it's good. The, in- the intro to the game is harrowing, though. I, f- I find that intro really properly not disturbing, but it was proper adult content. What, when he's in the wheelchair, kind of thing, or with, no? The, 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 the whole thing with the sort of with the with the husband beating. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah properly, yeah, sort that. of adult content, which is good. It's good. Yeah. It's good but that's good, right? Time. You mm, want yeah. you want you want games for adults like we're adults now, and exactly. we don't want ev- we don't want everything produced to be produced for a thirteen year old. Exactly oh, true. So yeah, there's that. I've been also been playing Doom as I always do. Oh um, yeah, yeah, I love that game. And bit of Pro oh, Evo yeah. 2018 on the Switch. I've been playing Riptide GP Renegade, which is a new one that just came out recently. It's a conversion of an iOS game, and oh, it's yeah. a fantastic, uh, really good fun um, jet ski game. It reminds me a lot of Hydro Thunder. And I spoke to the developer via email uh, briefly last week, and he said that Hydro Thunder is indeed an influence on that game. So you can see it from the off, really, as soon as you start playing it. Uh, Mantis Burn Racing, and also Doom on the Switch, and another game called Opus, The Day We Found Earth, which is another mobile game which has been translated onto onto the Switch. Wow. Um, yeah. So quite, quite a spread. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, most of these are because, you know, they, I, I see them pop up and they're quite cheap, and I go, I'll get that. It's only a tenner or, you know, 12 quid or whatever. Um, on the Dreamcast, uh, I've mainly been playing on Sturmwind because it's stunning. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. the, <laughs> one game I picked up this week, um, I, I saw it, it was really cheap. It was only 20 quid with the controller. Uh, pop, pop and music. Yeah, you know the uh, the rhythm game with the big yeah, controller. Yeah, and and the, the the notes come down the street, screen. You have to like smash the right controller button. It's just really There's, frantic and really good fun. I've just I just reviewed the whole series. Oh, I just yeah. got to like to and and there's a couple of songs on that first game are in my head every day. That's a good <laughs> thing or bad thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, An- anime hero. Try the anime hero song on okay. the first game. It is literally <laughs> the greatest song I've ever heard. I Possibly. had that with, um, you know, on Sonic Mania, you know, the flying battery, yeah. flying battery level, because yeah. I kept getting killed by that boss at the end, you know, the, the spider. <laughs> Every time it started up again, it goes, and it was just like in my head, like constantly that intro bit, like, oh, God. <laughs> I still haven't got past that bit on the game, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, that's all I've been playing on the Dreamcast, really, Sturmwind and Pop and Music. Um, so, yeah, quite the, uh, quite the collection all around, I think. Good spread across all of us. In that sense. Um, so, yeah, let's move on to our first news item. And this is that uh, I wrote an article this week, or whenever you listen to this podcast, it was in sort of mid December uh, 2017. And that is that there have been 15 games released on the Dreamcast in 2017, uh, which yeah, is more that's than quite the, something. Yeah, it's more than the Wii U. Uh, I don't know how many the <laughs> Wii U has actually had, but it's not 15. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll, I'll just go down the list. I haven't actually played all of these. I've, I've only, pl- well, I've played the vast majority. I've played about 75% of them. Uh, so the in no particular order are Breakers, uh, Rush Rush Rally Reloaded, Hermes, Flashback, Alice Dreams Tournament, 4x4 Jam, Dreamcast Noid, 128-bit War, uh, Escape 2042, Gun Ryu, Millennium Race of Y2K Fighters, that's not really a new game. It was one that was found on a dev kit and released. Right. Yeah. Um, and then some were re-releases, so you've got Sturmwind, uh, Zia and the Goddesses of Magic, Ducks, Ghostblade, and Alice's Mum's Rescue. Uh, John, have you played any or many of these? Not so many of these, other than I did check out the... Uh, well... Obviously, I haven't played I haven't played the Dreamcast version yet, but Flashback is one I really want to check out mm. because I'd really like to kind of do a feature looking at 
all the different versions of Flashback oh, sometime. That'd be, that'd be very good, yeah. And so I'm kind of tempted to get a copy of the Dreamcast version at this point and give it a, give it a whirl. Mm. Especially it because it's um, even though uh, even though it's um, it's built from the ground up for the Dreamcast, but I think there is some kind of emulation going on there as well. Um, and you do have different uh, kinds of visual gr- uh, what I'm trying to say, um, like filters. So you know, like when you use a, an emulator on a PC, you get like two times sal or, or whatever they call it. Right. Um, right you get that right. kind of kind of weird. It turn, almost turns it into like a sort of a cartoon or blends the pixels together. You do have that um, on as default, but you can turn it off. And as well as that, you also get uh, the original uh, PAL and Japanese versions of Flashback from the Mega Drive emulated. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. I yeah. also checked out a Millennium Racer, mm. uh, which you know it's neat. <laughs> yeah. I won't say it's a great game, but <laughs> I'm fascinated. I'm very fascinated with the history of that and how it sort of showed up the way it did. Yeah. But I'm sure that if we really, I mean, there's got to be other games out there like this for the Dreamcast somewhere because there were a lot of games in development for the system when it died. Totally, I totally agree. And and I mean, um, here we are in 2017, still finding new games. You know that. Have, yep. That have only just come to light. Um, I'm I'm convinced there are more in the uh, you know hidden away on dev kits and you know in people's attics or like the did you see the story a couple of months ago about the guy who found the copy of it was i think it was dear avenger dear avenger 3 oh yeah 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 and, and that was turned up at a yard sale so you know god knows what else is uh, just kind of floating about in the uh in the wild as it were or online um so yeah um mike i know you've got have you got all of these games I have. I haven't, I haven't got the re-releases from this year, but I've got all of them in one. Wow, nice. Mm. Yeah. Is, there any of the, is there any one that stands out in particular that you Yeah, think? 4x4 Jam. 4x4 Jam is a fantastic game. Um, yeah. Really? It's, it's, uh, it's, I say fantastic. It's not, it's not uh, going to you know, reinvent the wheel on the, on the Dreamcast, pardon the pun. Um, <laughs> it's not as good as some of the racers on the Dreamcast, but for a full 3D um, off-road racer, it does everything it needs to do. Um, it's a it's a really good fun game. It's 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 got cockpit view. It's probably it's a very small thing to impress you, but it impressed me more probably more than anything else. The fact it had a full cockpit view, mm-hmm. which um, even some Dreamcast games at the time didn't have. Um, yeah, yeah. MSR, for instance, didn't have a, a cockpit view. But uh, it's really good. It's 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 it is very much. You can see it's it's come from. Um, I know everyone keeps on saying it's a PSP game. It's not a PS game. It's a PSP mini game, which is is somewhat different. It's an originally it's a smartphone game, and you can tell it's a smartphone game originally. But like um, like you mentioned earlier on about Renegade Racers and stuff, uh, Riptide, sorry. Yeah. Um, some mobile games are looking amazing now, and on the Dreamcast, because of the fact they are on an old console, they they look a lot better than they would on a modern console. Yeah. Um, it's interesting actually. Uh... John, I don't know how much you know about 4x4 Jam. Basically, as Mike just said, there it was a, a, yep. a PSP mini game. Exactly. And, yeah, it, and it's funny because I, I downloaded the um, the PSP version onto my Vita just so I could sort of see what it looked like and how it played because it was only like two pounds ninety nine. Mm. And it's funny because it's got it's even got the same kind of like bugs and glitches in it. So, for example, when you first start the game, the trucks <laughs> the trucks kind of look like they've just been dropped, you know, on the suspension, and then they kind of slide, slide yeah. they slide yeah. down the down the landscape before the light goes green, and it does it in the Dreamcast version as well. So, <laughs> I thought that that's was really fascinating. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. and it's a shame that the PSP minis kind of thing seems like it's going to kind of die in the vine, so to speak, because they're yeah. downloadable only in the whole network being shut down and all that. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, actually. it's something that that's. So in a sense, I'm happy to see a game like this preserved on the Dreamcast in a way. Yeah. I mean, it's good to preserve the PSP version as well, but it's cool to have a real release of this game on yeah. another platform. It's an interesting point, actually, you make, um, because it is almost like digital preservation in a way. Yep. Because when mm-hmm. those games go off the PS Store, you've still got the, the physical version that you can play on a Dreamcast. So yeah, it's a, that's a very good point. never really thought of that before. Exactly. I think a, I think a lot of the PSP mini games as well, I say the majority of them are probably playable on Dreamcast. So, sure, the future is is pretty in, interesting by that mm. way. Yeah, and, and like I've, I've alluded to many times on the podcast, and I've, we can't really talk about it much um, because yeah. we've been sworn to secrecy. But there are some pretty interesting games coming into the Dreamcast in the uh, in the near future, and yeah. it's a yeah, it's, it's looking like it, it, 2018 will be another great year to uh, to own a Dreamcast. So, uh, yeah. 
Watch this space, as they say. Mm-hmm. Now, let's move on to the next news item, and this is that uh, a new Kickstarter game, Xenocritus, from the Bitmap Bureau, has been uh, confirmed as coming to the Dreamcast as a, uh, a stretch goal because they smashed the Kickstarter total of uh, £20,000 in about five minutes. No, <laughs> it was about two days or something. Uh, so they added a, a Dreamcast stretch goal. Uh, I quite like the look of this one. Have you seen this, Rob? Yeah, I saw your your piece on it. And I think it from what I've seen, it looks pretty cool. It does look like a lot of fun. I think one of the important things about it for me was in, in one of the comments where people were wondering how it controlled mm. because that's something I didn't I couldn't really get my head around like how it was actually going to map onto the Dreamcast controller. But if it's if it's quite natural and smooth and they've done a good job there, then yeah, I don't see why not. It looks a, it looks a ton of fun. I mean, if it's anything like they say, I mean, Rina Shooter in the sort of Contra, you know, or, you know, Alien Syndrome sort of uh, mold, then super. You know, yeah. those, those are quality yeah. titles. And if it's if it evokes Smash TV as well, then great. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah, point looks, you make. It, Sorry, John, go ahead. It looks very Smash TV to me, I think. But I think it has the opportunity to be special because they got some good get, some good people doing the art and sound and everything. So it has a really nice aesthetic to it already. Yeah. And the sound sample in there is excellent. Definitely. And the control wise, you know, I mean, obviously on Dreamcast they could have they could easily handle it just like Smash TV on the Super NES, for instance, where each each of the face buttons is a different direction for your gun. Oh yeah. And you move with the D pad. Hmm. But on the Mega Drive, they might have to do something like, you know, when you hold a button in a certain direction, you could strafe and you you yeah. let go of that and you're just walking around normal. I don't know, something like that. It'll be interesting yeah, to see yeah. how it maps. It'll be yeah. like, uh, I imagine it'll be very similar to Chaos Engine on a Mega Drive. That could work. Because I think the Mega Drive port of Smash TV uh, did not control especially well. No. So I, I don't want to see it like that. <laughs> it might be interesting if they can get, um, you know, twin stick support. Dreamcast Twin Sticks, oh, that might be quite good. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, that'd be Ooh. interesting. Yeah, and they're, they're actually only based down the road from me in Southampton. I might nip up there and have a quiet word and say, look, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Twin Sticks. <laughs> That's an amazing idea. Um, no, yeah. um, I do quite like the kind of Aliens vibe as well, the, you know, the aesthetic um, that they've got yeah, going yeah. on. It's very much, it looks very much inspired by the Aliens franchise, um, the good Aliens films anyway, yes. not the uh, later ones, which are absolutely turd. Um, but, <laughs> uh, interesting interesting side uh, aside here actually um, somebody put something on Twitter earlier on uh, it was some artwork uh, it was some hand drawn aliens artwork and a couple of different websites like um, science fiction kind of uh, websites and things were sort of tagged in this tweet and I just rep- I thought that's really cool that so I, I, I replied absolutely badass which is obviously a, an immortal line from the, from the film Aliens and uh, none other than Carrie Hen Newt Favorited my tweet, so I was like, "Wow, that's, that's, nice. pretty cool. that's awesome!" <laughs> that was pretty pretty cool. So uh, yeah, that made my Sunday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean? Made your Sunday? Made your year more like? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get my Wayland Utani jacket out of the cupboard and dust it off and put it on as a celebration. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Xeno Crisis coming to a Dreamcast near you soon, hopefully, with Twin Sticks apart. No, it's not. Uh, right, let's move on to uh, the main meat of our uh, festive episode of the Dream Pod. Uh, Mr. John Linneman, all eyes are now on oh. you. You oh. are the. Uh, <laughs> you are here to be interrogated. No, um, yeah, so obviously you are our guest, and thank you very much for coming onto the show. As alluded to earlier, you are the face and voice of DF Retro and also Digital Foundry proper, and also uh, Eurogamer, because I, I, I have noticed that you've uh, started putting some written content up on, on Eurogamer as well as the, the video content. Of um, course. Yeah, so I think what we're going to do is we're just going to have a little bit of a chat about you and, and the work that you do and, and you know also the uh, the videos as well. Um, so I'm going to begin by asking you what your kind of history is with the with the Dreamcast and kind of games in general. Sure, yeah. No, the Dreamcast is an important system for me because it was – so I was console gaming in the early 90s and then I kind of get into PC gaming for a while mm-hmm. and – the Dreamcast kind of pulled me back to consoles. I saw it launch in Japan, which prompted me to go out and buy a Sega Saturn and a ton of games with it. Yeah. Just sort of in preparation. And I'm glad I did because a lot of those games, you know, pretty expensive these days. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I had Dreamcast ready to go. You know, in the in the U.S. it launched on nine nine ninety nine, as mm-hmm. I'm sure you know. Mm-hmm. 
And I bought it day one with Sonic Adventures, Soul Calibur, and Blue Stinger. Oh, nice. Blue Stinger. What, what's a selection? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I was I was super excited about it. I mean, it felt like the future when I, at the time, like you come home and put in Soul Calibur for the first time back in 1999. And it just looked like seeing that in your home was just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, I agree. Um, I my, was all the way into it. My first game for the Dreamcast was uh, Speed Devils. And I didn't even have a Dreamcast when I bought the game. I knew oh. I was getting one. So I had this game. It was sat on the table for like a week before I got the Dreamcast. And I just kept looking at the back of the box going, oh, I want to play this game so much. <laughs> and obviously when I did it, it was mind-blowing. Um, but yeah, um, I did see your video recently on Soul Calibur. And just going back to what you said there, where you said you saw this game on your TV in your house, you know, looked amazing, looked better than the arcades, you know. Um, yeah, it did. Because the, the original Soul uh, so Blade, I mean, it was based on sort of PlayStation technology, wasn't it, the arcade? Yeah, the arcade version was. I mean, some of Namco's games used more advanced hardware, like Ridge Racer and, I guess, some of the Tekken games as well, Tekken 3 and beyond. They they did use more powerful hardware, but Soul Blade, Soul Edge basically shared, you know, the PlayStation and arcade version were very, very similar. Yeah. So you never really got this feeling of, like, the potential was there, but it was a 30 frames per second fighter, kind of chunky looking, but still fun. Mm. And then Soul Calibur comes to the arcade using the more powerful hardware. And this was the first time I think we'd ever seen an arcade game get so massively upgraded for the Dreamcast. And the fact that it was upgraded so quickly, I think it was much less than a year yeah. that Namco took to bring that game to the Dreamcast. And they completely redid everything. Mm. It just looks absolutely incredible. So, yeah, it was a really impressive uh port and namco would kind of go on to do that again with things like tech and tag tournament and other games like that where they take an older game bring it back and you know refresh the whole thing in that way it's um it's a shame that namco didn't really put more effort into their dreamcast output after that amazing kind of announcement they then went on yeah. and did things like mr driller and namco you know Arcade. what though I, at the time, I remember being disappointed with Mr. Driller, mm. but you go back now, and it's like, Mr. Driller is a really good game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not a technical showpiece like Soul Calibur, but it's it looks nice. It's a ton of fun, and it's it was an actually... I feel like Mr. Driller was really underappreciated in his time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> We've spoken about this quite a lot on the, on the podcast, how back in that era, it was kind of, everything has to be 3D. Like yep, 2D didn't yep. have the same appre- appreciation. Just on the subject of Mr. Driller, did you know that it was microphone compatible? What? Yeah. Nice. Uh, Aaron, one of our other co-hosts, uh, told me this. Um, basically, if you shout drill into the microphone when it's plugged in, it will drill. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that either. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, John, when you, obviously, you, you were a Dreamcast owner day one. Um, oh, yeah. Can you remember the, you know, did you, did you have the Dreamcast all the way through its natural life until so the end? So, I was really into the Dreamcast, I have to admit. I was following everything as closely as I could, and I was pretty much buying every major Dreamcast game as it hit. I was still, I just started college, a university at that point, mm. and had some decent disposable income, I suppose. So, I mean, I remember keeping track of each new game as it would come out. And at first it was a little bit slow. You know, stuff like Marvel vs. Capcom hit a little bit later. Sometimes things were disappointing, like Soul um, Soul Fighter was terrible. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I remember waiting for that. And, you know, some of the stuff later in the year, there was a bad port of Shadow Man on there, but I still enjoyed the game. Yeah. Uh, Evolution, the world of Sacred Device. Yeah. Which at the time I didn't appreciate much because I wasn't so much into the random dungeon kind of thing, but I understand it better now. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. I I was thinking, oh, it's like a Final Fantasy style game, and it really isn't. And that's okay because it's not what it was trying to be. (laughs) I have to be honest, it's one of them games that I've I've started but never really got into, so I just kind of left it. And I think I've still still got a save somewhere on a VMU from my first attempt at it, like, you know, five years ago or something. I can get that, yeah. And but the there was another RPG that came out the first Christmas at least in the u.s on dreamcast you guys know elemental gimmick gear oh yes that never came out over here but i've heard so it has horrible cover art nobody seemed to care about it but the game is gorgeous and just awesome like i you know i got that that year around the holiday times and it basically turned out to be a zelda style uh, action rpg sort of and it's it's great. I loved it. And then, you know, you go into the next year and it's Dead or Alive 2, Crazy Taxi, Resident Evil Code Veronica, uh, Time Stalkers, which may be not the best. <laughs> I remember the summer, you know, uh, Virtual On, Oratorio Tangram comes out. 
I had an import version of Jet Set Radio, you know, things like that. Just kind of followed it all the way through, all the way up through Sonic Adventure 2 coming out and after the system was already dead and, you know, Shenmue 2 and all that. So, yeah, I was kind of there all the way through it, and I've never let go of my system, and I have all my original games so you, and a whole system, lot more. <laughs> so the system you've got now is the one that you originally bought on 9999? So, yeah, I have my 9991 cool. system and then two other U.S. systems, like, one case was literally I was just at a game store and some guy walked in to trade in a Sega Sports Dreamcast mm. and so, several games. And the guy at the counter was like, oh, we don't really take that anymore. And, <laughs> and then the guy looked disappointed. And I was like, um, I'll, I'll give you like it. 10 bucks for it. And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, 10 bucks for a nice Sega Sports Dreamcast and some games. And so that was all good. And then I got a Japanese one. A friend of mine gave me a, um, a Sakura Tyson Dreamcast with all the... Uh, games for that so i use that for my rather large japanese collection now is that the pink one with the, the sort of little yeah, exactly on it? yeah, it's yeah, that yeah. one nice. <laughs> <laughs> i got the box and everything with it it's uh it's wow. something yeah that's pretty cool amazing um i was gonna ask you have you played a game called uh evolution seventh cross uh, yes that was that Very was one of the earliest game. actually it's an interesting thing so i was at a trade show recently and i picked up all of the original japanese launch titles yes for the system, like Sengoku Turb and mm -hmm. July and stuff like that. And it kind of inspired me to kind of like, I, I next year I'd like to do an episode really focused on the Dreamcast itself and its humble beginnings, so to speak. Mm. And because, um, so at this year's EGX, uh, EGX, you guys familiar with EGX? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Gamer yeah. Expo. Mm -hmm. So this year, Richard and I, we did a DF Retro panel. I've seen it. Yes, I watched it on YouTube. So there was, well, that was the second <laughs> Saturn, right? Yeah. Well, we did another one in September, and the guy messed up the mic. And so we filmed the whole thing, and it turns out we got no audio. Oh. So it was basically a lost panel. <laughs> and this one was focused. It was essentially part two where we focused mostly on the Dreamcast. Oh, no. That would have been amazing. And, you know, all the early stuff with uh, the 3D effects and the lawsuit around that and uh, Richard talking about his early days, essentially shopping the dreamcast around cause he was trying to get the contract to run the dreamcast magazine. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who, so who was he working for then? So, you know, Richard Ledbetter, he was yes. the editor of Sega Saturn magazine. Correct. Yes. And you know, when the Sega Saturn died, it, they did a few issues on dreamcast and it was like, okay, well got to move on to something else. And he put it, you know, he was trying to, essentially work on an official Dreamcast magazine and ended up working on something else instead, unfortunately. But he did go to a lot of the, um, essentially the introduction of the system. So he flew out to Japan. Uh, he was there for like the new challenge conferences, like the Dreamcast being revealed with all the creators coming out, things like that, you know, which I've only ever experienced through very low quality videos, but it's amazing <laughs> to hear this firsthand experience of being flown out to Japan in the late nineties to see the Dreamcast being revealed by Sega. Yeah. One of the most interesting things for me about those kind of videos that you mentioned, um, I've got the um, the Dreamcast Express, you know, the demo discs that were given away with the partners. Yes. Um, and on one of them, there is a, a massive kind of feature about Tokyo Game Show 99. And oh, there's, yeah. There's so much merchandise with Dreamcast. You've got, like, fans and, and towels and, and hats and oh. bags. And it's just, like... If I could go back in time to then and just get as much of this stuff as I could, you know, and all that stuff now is, you know, where is it? You never see it like on eBay or, you know, it's just in landfill or it's in a bin, you know, it's just gone. It's a shame. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd love stuff like that, to be honest. Um, cool. So you were, uh, you know, you're obviously a, a true dreamcaster like the rest of us here. So uh, that's good oh, yeah. to know. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, um, how did, I mean, how did Digital Foundry start? What, how, how did all that come, come to be? Well, I can talk about it. So I didn't start Digital Foundry, of course. That was Richard's uh, thing. And he started it in the late aughts, I believe, yeah. like in the 2007, 2008 era. And before that, it was actually still the same name, but he was doing other things related to like DVD duplication for magazines and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I believe in this case, he just started doing these kinds of like quick comparison articles, like showcasing the differences between 360 and 360 or 360 and PS3 games. Mm. And just over time, it started to, it seems to me like as a reader at the time, it just seemed to pick up steam. And, you know, Tom Morgan came in and Dave came in 
and then myself, I kind of started working with them in 2013. Okay. So how did, I le- how did that happen? I mean, how, how did so you So I was involved? working in um, the automotive industry, uh, doing a lot of programming and um, other, you know, networking stuff in the background. And then my wife wanted to move back to Europe since she's from France. Okay. And so I quit my job and just applied to work with DF and started out doing freelancing initially. And the first the first ever video I did was on the demo version of Puppeteer for PlayStation 3, <laughs> followed by uh, that patched version of Zone of the Enders 2 HD. And, and now here so, you are, the face and voice of Digital Foundry Retro. <laughs> yeah, so the Retro series was kind of just like, Rich didn't really think that anybody cared about Retro. Mm. And the other guys had even said, hey, can we do Retro? And he's like, mm, nah, I'm like you know, it's not going to do well. So I did my own. I wanted to do it on my own. And it started from because of Shenmue 3, they were like, we should do a little retrospective on Shenmue. So I did that Shenmue episode. Yeah. And I did it in like February and then just sat on it for months. And then so, at some random point, I did like this random episode on special. I just put it out there and enough people seemed to care about it that he was like, hmm, let's try this again. So then we put the Shenmue episode up in that. It's it's for me it's the most fun to work on those videos right now I think yeah and you can kind of, you can kind of do the the craziest stuff with it I think and really kind of tell some interesting stories yeah I love how you know deep you go into into the games that you're you know analyzing on DF Retro again you mentioned the Shenmue video I watched uh, the Shenmue and Shenmue Two videos earlier and it's just the way that you present sort of quite technical terminology but in a way that is quite easy for people who are thick like me to understand <laughs> <laughs> there was um, a little section a very little section that really stuck with me it was it was almost like a throwaway comment but you dis- described how mip mapping works in Shenmue oh, yeah. 2 and mm-hmm. there's a little display on the screen with like you know how it actually you know stops shimmering in the screen and I was like ah that's really interesting I didn't really understand that before, but um, you know I've, I've learned something here. So it's a, it's an it's an edutainment style of video. I, I would uh, I would that's say. Good. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that because that's kind of the thing is it's a lot of complex stuff to talk about, and uh, I try to make it in a way that's fun to listen to and easy enough to understand. And mm-hmm. you know it's it's also kind of an angle I think that's not explored as often when because people talk about retro games a lot now, right? It's a big thing. Yes. But I try to focus more on more of the technology, you know, appreciation of the game as a whole, but with sort of a little bit of a focus on the tech st- side of things and the way the ports worked and what made this so impressive for the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, I've seen those videos and that's what really stood out to me. Like we hear a lot here of, 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 on this podcast and just general in the Dreamcast community that people go, oh, yeah, Shenmue was well ahead of its time. But then they don't sort of expand on that. And so exactly. it was really, really refreshing even for me was, um, to watch those because you literally did explain very clearly exactly why it was so ahead of its time. Exactly. Yeah, mm. yeah Shenmue is a those – are, those are some great games. And I was happy to finally meet Yu Suzuki this year for the oh, first wow. time. Cool. So that was really exciting. Did, I mean, when you met him, did he? Did you have a translator, or did he speak English? Or um, so it was kind of. So what I did is I actually recorded the interview and had to transcribe it, and so for that I just used a translator. But you know, I spoke to him some in, in my somewhat rusty Japanese. <laughs> well, it's, it's no doubt better than mine because I can't speak a word of Japanese. Oh wait, minute, <laughs> Jan, um, what is it? Uh, origato is that Japanese? Yeah, what yeah. Does, what does that mean? What does it mean? Thank, that's just saying thank you. Okay, <laughs> origato. <laughs> But yeah, so the thing that blew me away about Yu Suzuki is just the, the man is so unbelievably humble. Like mm. he, it almost feels like he can't even begin to understand why people were so impressed with what he was doing. Yeah. Like it's kind of like, oh, well, it was just my job kind of thing, you know. Like he doesn't fully appreciate just the kind of work that him and his team was doing at the time and how far ahead of it, it was compared to so many other things going on. Yeah. No, it's that's... really amazing. That's that's. I think those are the more, most kind of endearing, or you know, people that you know you you want to kind of give kudos to the ones who are kind of just very, as you say, humble, yeah. You know, I think if you're going to have some sort of hall of fame, like developers hall of fame, then Suzuki's got to be in there, right? I mean, oh, his, for sure. 
His legacy is just insane. Like all the way through the eighties and through the nineties, and well, even to now, literally from the, from the early eighties to now, it's just been some of the most you know notable games you can think of. He he's been behind them. So, yeah. and beyond that, what's to me like thinking of technology, it's the fact that they were trailblazing in terms of tech. They were building games on hardware as the hardware was being made. Mm. I mean, they you know what I mean? It's yeah. like yeah, okay, yeah. Model Three doesn't exist yet, so it's being worked on and they're developing Virtua Fighter 3 as the hardware is being created. And there's yeah. no, there's no, there's barely any references out there. Nobody's ever done it before. There's no like discussion to have with other developers. I mean, they're trailblazing this from nothing and that's, and also doing standout gameplay that it's just like top of its game. So when you combine all that together, it's really just amazing to think of how they were able to pull that off from nothing, basically. Yeah. They, they, I, as you say, they were, basically you know finding their way in the dark you know yeah exactly yeah. But, but also coming out with these amazing experiences you know which they had no right to do really you know and they're so polished still that's the thing you go back to them now and they still hold up so well and it's just how did they pull this off mm. yeah totally like one of the other things just slightly away from a from a pure tech thing that stood out to me was in 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 your first Shenmue video where you talk about the attention to detail that goes into that game in terms of world world building, yeah, and yeah, it scares me. Like, well, it legit. When I was watching it, it sort of reminded me of like just how much ridiculous fine detail there is in that game, and it sort of scares me to think of ha- handling a project of that size. And as you said, handling a project of that size while you're also developing the tech at the same time, it, it's it's mind blowing, really. Yeah, and hearing about some of the stories, like how they were basically like tracking everything in Excel sheets and just lots of like the code was almost falling apart at points. I mean, it was very un- unfriendly, the environment it sounds like that they worked in. Mm. So the fact that they mm. were able to pull it all together and have it work as well as it did is just, it feels like a miracle to me looking in. Yeah, it's really, um, it's really amazing stuff that they did. Um, I think you've already kind of almost kind of answered this next question, but. Um, how do you how do you choose which games you, you're going to cover on DF Retro or, or in general? I mean, do you have like a like a big list and you say yes? So, or... yeah, for retro, it's mostly just um, kind of whatever I'm in the mood for. Oh, okay. Uh, and also, you know, I plan projects in advance now, so to mm. sort of come up with what I want to do in the future. And it's a lot of times it's just the games I know a lot about and I'm very passionate about because I don't really want to pick a game that I don't care about that much because it would kind of come through in the video. I think, you know, there's no point in doing that. Yeah. But I have, a, there's a lot of games I love, so it's easy to pick up, pick through those, find the ones that really made a mark and just start going down the list, you know, and what's interesting and what's different and try to get some variety in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I, I know what you mean. I mean, when I do the the articles, the written articles on the Dreamcast Junkyard, I, if, if I'm going to write about a particular game, there's been times where I've started writing a, an article and I've been, I don't even like this game. It's rubbish. I, I'm not even, I, don't, I, I have no desire to continue playing it and taking screenshots and writing this this copy because I'm not enjoying it. So I totally get what you're, uh, what you're saying there. You have to be able to enjoy a game that you're going to cover. Um yeah, so uh, some of the, the games that you've covered uh, for the Dreamcast on Digital Foundry Retro uh, are uh, Soul Reaver and yep. Sh- obviously Shenmue, uh, Daytona, that was a really interesting video, Soul Calibur. Um, do you have a like a favourite Dreamcast game? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> and, I mean, I feel like Soul Calibur might be at the top yeah. just because it's so perfect. Yes. Yeah, but in terms of just like uh, emotional resonance, I almost want to say Jet Set Radio, maybe. Oh, yeah. oh. like it's just such a. Uh, there's something about it that just really, really works for me. It's a really great game, and this the style, look, the sound. You put that in, and you just hear that, and it's just like, oh yeah, I'm back in this. Yeah. Did you see that? <laughs> Did you see the story? I think it only actually came out today um, about the proof of concept that a company gave gave to Sega and they turned it down. There's a video on YouTube. Uh, it's called Jet Set Radio Evolution. Um, huh. Yeah, it's, it looks I really I need cool. to check that out. Yeah, it's it's like um, it's pre-rendered, but it, it looks very uh, in style with uh, Jet Set Radio Future and apparently it was turned down by Sega. So even when oh, people are giving Sega the, 
the, uh, the the content they don't they don't really want it. Um, That's crazy, isn't it? Because all, all people constantly keep you know bugging Naganuma for is like, where's the next Jet Set Radio? And it's like, well, somebody actually produced it, and Sega went no. <laughs> <laughs> On, on yeah, that, that subject, that's crazy. Uh, my favorite Dreamcast game might surprise you, but it's actually Rush 2049 because I just wow absolutely love that game because it's so ridiculous. Uh, so it is. <laughs> maybe I should cut that out because. <laughs> 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 um, excellent. Uh, so, John, is, are there any games that you're, you, you know, you'd really like to cover but you haven't done so yet? Uh, there's a couple that I'd like to suggest, if I may, that mm, I would yeah, really love to see means, on please. DS Retro. Um, Doom three, uh, for you know, on the Xbox uh, oh. and the um, PS yes. three, and also the original Xbox. Um, that would be that would be. I probably cool. do. Yes, I, I I have actually thought of that, and I I do kind of want to do something on Doom three as a whole, mm. not just the console ports, but like you know, Doom three was kind of an important game for three D graphics. Yeah, and I love the game actually, despite some of its flaws. I think it's great. So yeah. I remember I when, it first, cover that. when it first came out, I had the PC I had was a, it had a Celeron, a Celeron processor. Um, <laughs> but I had, a, I got a really good Radeon graphics card and it oh. had 768 megabytes of RAM and a Celeron <laughs> two gigahertz processor. And I, put Doom 3 on it, and it must have run at about five frames a second. So <laughs> I, I still play through it. <laughs> That's the worst bit. I, I do remember get, I, I remember on the, I think it was on the manual or on the back of the box on Doom 3, It was there was some sort of message saying, like, to, to experience this in the best possible way, you need to turn off, turn off all the lights and, you know, turn up your sound and... Uh, you know, because it's a quite scary experience. And then I was just like, I did that. And then I can remember going, man, this is not as scary as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, yeah, I never found it to be that scary, honestly, but it is a, it's a good action game. I think there's the, a lot of jump scares, aren't there? Because, yeah. I mean, that game is like monster closet heaven. It's like walk down a <laughs> corridor, turn around. Oh, look, a monster's appeared. <laughs> Which that, That's an interesting example of uh, game design influenced by technology. I believe, yeah, because, you know, uh, with the way Doom 3 works, you know, just rendering more than a few enemies on screen at once, it was quite a drain on resources, especially mm-hmm. with all the shadows and everything. So enemies appear like that, and then you kill them, and then they immediately fade away. Oh, and yeah. that's sort of like, you know, you know that weird yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. burning effect that they do. Mm-hmm. Because I believe the idea is that they don't want to leave a lot of enemies on screen or littering the levels just because it would have impacted performance too much at the time. Definitely. Yeah, didn't, like, um, you couldn't noticed... just... Sorry, go, oh, sorry ahead. go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I noticed that happened on even on the Doom port of Switch, on the Switch port of Doom now. Now, I haven't done a comparison to see if the enemies drop off that quickly on, on PS4, Xbox One, PC. Oh, yeah, they, they do still drop off in that game, but of course, you oh. know, there's a lot more enemies in general that, that can appear. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if there was if there was just ragdoll corpses everywhere, that would kind of destroy performance, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Just on the on the topic of Doom, um, the Doom video again that you did was um, phenomenal, and uh, the one where you compare every different version of Doom. Oh yes, that was, that was a that long was one. Really cool. I, <laughs> that, I, that took a lot of work. I'm a massive fan of Doom. Uh, I've been a fan oh, of Doom too. for for years. You know, ever since it first came out, and I just love the sort of the weird kind of techno. Sort of, what's the word? Um, biomechanical, almost um, Geigerish. Uh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just phenomenal. It's just brilliant. I love it. Um, and also the Doom video that you did on the Switch. You know, where you compared the Switch version to the to the oh, new yeah. to the new versions. That was quite interesting because I've got both the PS4 and the Switch versions of Doom. And, you know, obviously playing it on my little handheld, it's amazing and it's really cool to have Doom on that thing. But when you compare it to what you get on the PS4, yeah. it is it's so blurry. Difference. Yeah, it's just like, wow. Cause sometimes it's hard to read the actual words on the screen, you know, the text. Yeah. Um, but it's still a, a phenomenal um, accomplishment to get a game that graphically impressive onto a, onto a handheld. So, um, so yeah. Uh, John, one other game that I would love to see on a Digital Family Retro is Starfighter. Starfighter 3000, because I don't know how familiar you are with this game, but that's on, on the, a 3DO as well, I believe. It right? Certainly is, yeah. The, yes, yes, I've played it. The 3DO version is um, far and away superior 
to the uh, the PlayStation and the Saturn versions because in the Saturn and PlayStation versions you've got this really thick fog, almost like again like talk. Right, right. Whereas on the on the 3DO, the, the, it's completely clear the sky for, for miles. You know, the horizon stretches off into the distance, and it's just really like weird how that game runs so well on the 3DO and then on systems that are supposedly a lot more powerful. Well, they are obviously. Um, yeah, the game much just, more. The game just just looks like well crap. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's interesting weird. because, yeah, uh, the 3DO is not very fast at 3D mm. or 2D for that matter. It's a pretty slow machine. Yeah, it's um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And, uh, I, you know, if you, you get the chance to check it out, I would uh, highly recommend just having a look, quick look at the Saturn and PlayStation versions. Yeah, I need to check this out. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like we have come to a nice natural end to this uh, episode of the, of the Dream Pod, unless... Uh, Mike or Rob, you've got any more questions for, for John? Um, no, I think I'm good. Yeah, excellent. Mike, right. are, you, are you still awake? I, no, I, I am still awake. <laughs> I am still, I am still, not, not that I'm bored by the subject. I, I, I explained that, Tom, because the context now sounds like I was bored. I, no, I, no, I I'm too long shift. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mike came straight from work uh, to the podcast, so that's why he's uh, been a little bit quiet. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah a, long, a long week, I believe. Um, uh, one last question for you, John. Have yeah. you have you got your Christmas tree up yet? <laughs> well, we do have one up, yes. Excellent. How would you rate it out of ten? Uh it's about it's about a six out of ten. Oh, Ooh, it's and pretty on small that note, and it's artificial. <laughs> are you are you pro ten tinsel or anti tinsel? Oh, I'm anti tinsel. <laughs> that's the correct answer <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of Christmas trees it's a very quick anecdote um, my girlfriend said oh I'll get a tree I'll get a, I'll get a little tree put it, in the living room, <laughs> put it on the table and uh, I said okay great yeah I'm expecting her to go and get these you know you get them ones that are like you know waist height that small kind of thing Oh yeah. And, and, and she went off to the shop and I was doing something and then she came back and she opened the front door and I said I called down I said oh do you want, do you want a hand getting the Christmas tree out of the car and she was like oh no it's alright I've already done it I was like oh Winner, I didn't, I didn't hear you bring it in. <laughs> so I went, I went down the stairs, and, and on the table was this sh- shrub. It was a shrub. It was about a foot high. I was like, is that it? Is that the Christmas tree? I'm not even really that bothered about Christmas trees, but I'm not having that in the house. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, went, I went back and got a big It was tiny. <laughs> That's great. It's ridiculous. But it's now on my, uh, on my shelf in the games room, looking nice there, it, resplendent with its lights on. So win-win, I think, after the... Uh, <laughs> atrociousness of that anyway guys that's brought us to the end of our podcast uh thank you thank you thank you very much mr john lineman for joining us today it's been an absolute of pleasure course. thank you yeah and uh obviously uh every, most people listening to this will obviously know who you are and what you do but if you'd like to uh just like tell us again where you're where you can be found sure, on yeah. like, twitter on on youtube you can find us at youtube.com slash digital foundry or on eurogamer under the Digital Foundry umbrella, and I'm on Twitter at Dark1X. Fantastic. Like a true pro. Said like a true pro. Uh, Rob, <laughs> you can be found on Twitter. Oh, I can, yes. At R Nicholas J. That's R Nicholas J, all one word, no spaces. Fantastic. All right. And what about you, Mike? You can be found on Twitter. I can. Uh, space underscore turnip. Space underscore turnip. I can be found on Twitter at Tom Lee C, or we can be found as a collective at the DC Junkyard, also on Facebook at www facebook.com forward slash Dreamcast Junkyard or groups forward slash Dreamcast Junkyard or just search Dreamcast, you'll find us. Uh, also on YouTube, uh, youtube.com forward slash Dreamcast Junkyard, I think that's right. Uh, I'm waffling now, so on that bombshell, I think we will call it a day. Thank you very much again, John. Uh, everybody say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Mike. Hey, it's time to make some crazy money. Are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> Please stop this disc now, 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 now.